At the beginning of this year, um, well, over Christmas time, I think it was because of October the 7th, um, I just continually found myself crying out to God all over Christmas, Lord, I am so dry. I am so dry. And I, I'm never, I'm never, I never felt that I'd not got direction. Do you understand what I mean? Never had that feeling before. But going through Christmas, I thought, Lord, what are we supposed to be doing? Um, anyway, the Lord led me to look at Ephesians and the armour of God. So I'm going to look at a little bit of that in this session. So it begins by saying, finally, whatever remains in your life, friends, whatever's left of your life, and all of us have got different time spans, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. I can remember 20 years ago, Mandy and myself, we left our house. We had a lovely house over on the top of Malcop. We came to live here. We were wet behind the ears. I'd never done any pastoring before in my life. I was full of beans and hope and faith and all the rest of it. And within no time, we had a two-bedroom house with nine people living in there. We had this homeless guy whose feet absolutely stank. I have never smelt feet like it. We had, a, we had a, um, an African um, couple that came to the church and literally dropped off their son with us. We thought he was just staying with us for a few days. Ended up, they just left. And they left us with this young African guy called Percy. We had uh, a youth pastor and his wife stopping with us. We had Mandy's brother stopping with us. There was nine of us in a two-bedroom house. And... Over a period of a few months, God just began to bring people over here. And they were traveling from quite distances to come over here. And it, for a time, it was electric, absolutely electric. And I can remember um, 20 years ago, the guy that we picked up, who was a you know, homeless guy, whose feet absolutely reeked. And, you know, we witnessed to him and all the rest of it. Um, he was sitting at the back where that camera is right now. And I was preaching on Revelation chapter 9. And I was preaching on the subject of self-harm. That people in the days to come, will, they'll gnaw on their own tongues, that, but they won't repent. People will harm themselves, but they, they won't repent. As I'm studying, as I am right now, preaching on self-harm and that the gospel is the only answer to self-harm, I saw something I'd never seen before, and it's hard if you've never seen it to describe it, but I saw this guy, these guys' eyes go like goblins' eyes. They bulged. They started to bulge and bulge and bulge, and I, th I kept looking and thinking, this is the guy that we, we got in our house. Stopping with us, whose feet reeked. And as his, his eyes were getting bigger and bigger, and they were bulging out of his face. And then his jaw went like this. It went right over like that, and I thought, there's something wrong. There's something wrong here. And I stood here, and I, <laughs> you know, you, you, you kind of, uh, you know that the Holy Spirit's with you. Well, all of a sudden, he shrieked. I mean, he screamed this place out. He got up, he came down that aisle, people jumped out of the seats, ran in the back and locked themselves in the toilets. That's, the on, that's what happened. They locked themselves in the toilets. He got up onto this platform and his fists were flying everywhere, all around my face. I could, and I stood there thinking, how on earth has he not hit me? And I stood there asking the Lord, what do you want me to do? What do you want me to do, Lord? And, and I just felt the Lord say, do not take your eyes off his eyes. Look at him and don't take your eyes off him. And somehow I managed by looking him in the eyes. Have you ever seen Star Trek with tractor beams? Yeah. I somehow managed to tractor beam him out of the church by, with my eyes. I kind of dragged him out with my eyes. And he got to about where, um, almost at the back, 
And there's a great big guy in the church at the time that, that was the size of a rhinoceros, I kid you not. And he grabbed him, he says, right son, like this. And we got him through the door and we got him outside. And because he'd been in our house for quite some time, he burst into tears. He started to smash his head continuously, butting and butting and butting the uh, stone wall outside. And we knew he was possessed, no doubt about it. And, um, you know, he, he began to cry and he said, I've never been loved before in my life, all this stuff. And we said, we, we want to pray for you. We're going to fast for you. We're going to set a day where we pray for you and so on. Uh, so we got ready for it. Everybody was fasting. He never turned up. He went. He left. Off he went. So 20 years later, in the middle of COVID, I get a phone call. 20 years later. Do you remember me? As soon as I heard his voice, you know, he kind of had the voice of a psycho. So, as I, yes, I know your voice. He says, it's me. I, said, I know it's you. He says, I've been in prison. <laughs> He'd been in prison for murder. Been in prison for murder. But something had happened because uh, in prison he was um, witnessing to people, he was sharing the gospel and all sorts of things. Whether or not, I don't know, whether or not he'd gotten saved, it's not for me to know. All I'm telling you is this, 20 years ago, um, we were not what we are now. If you look at all of us, how we were 20 years ago and what we would do for Christ 20 years ago, all of us are struggling, all of us are. And we, used to, we, we were all risk takers. I can remember once we, we put a tract in every pub across the road, a pub across the road, put a tract on every single table. We, we got outside, we were worshipping the Lord, singing praise and worship songs. And I watched immediately after we put those tracks in a punch up start, a proper brawl, a full on brawl. And it went like a wave. You know, like when you watch a wave go across the sea, this punch-up went from one end of the pub literally to the other end of the pub. The whole pub, within minutes of putting tracks in there, was battering one another. And we were just worshipping the Lord, thinking, you know, we were called for this. We were called for this. This is what it is to be a Christian. 20 years ago, that was. 20 years ago. And the truth is, all of us are struggling. We don't fully know why we're struggling. Something happened on October the 7th. There was some shift that happened on October the 7th. Something is happening that's coming over this nation. Maybe we can't see. I don't know. But it's, it's not the same. This place is not the same. And the people of God are not the same either. And there's no young people coming through. And what it alarms me is that what young people desperately need to get hold of, I call them Generation Zers, is what you and I take for granted. When we look at Revelation, Daniel, when we look at Zechariah, and what we're busy doing, and please don't take this the wrong way, any of you, we are busy equipping people with the end times a lot of whom are not even going to be there because the Lord will take them. Take them. And so we have to find a way of getting this message to the younger ones because it's a guarantee they're going to see some terrible, terrible things happen in this country. But I believe there's hope, folks. Do you? Yeah. I do believe there's hope. Jacob talked about it earlier on. I believe there's hope. So this is what Paul said. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Now, if you want to turn very quickly to John, John chapter 20, John chapter 20, in John chapter 20, verse, um, verse 19, Jesus says to the disciples, peace to you, peace to you. When he had said this, he showed them both of his hands and his side and the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also have sent you. And when he had said these things, he breathed on them and said, receive the Holy Spirit. We see the same thing in Genesis chapter 2, when God breathes into Adam and he becomes a living being. And we know that the Holy Spirit is given to us 
We are sealed with the Holy Spirit at the point when we're born again. And I believe this is when the disciples were born again. And um, you and I, all of us, we're living in a time when many, many Christians of our age have seen massive abuse in the Holy Spirit. From the days of Toronto to Pensacola to Lakeland to this nonsense that we're seeing today. And there's been an awful lot of people that have been hurt. I shared this with our church. We used to have a, a my grandma and granddad used to have a, a collie dog called Skippy. And I loved Skippy, he was an outside dog and you could play with him, do anything with him, you could ride him along on the grass and he, he was great, he would never harm you or anything. One day I saw Skippy the dog uh, hiding away in some bushes and of course I wanted to just go up to Skippy and play with him like I normally do. Uh, I didn't realise at the time he'd been hit by a car. But he was, he was trying to hide away underneath these bushes. I go up to him as a young child, try to stroke him, and he bites my hand, right? I believe there are many, many Christians that have been spiritually abused over the years that at one time were very open to the Lord in many ways and they were full on for the Lord and they've been hit. They've been hit by something spiritual that has really, really put them off. And now they don't know what to believe anymore. And I, I'll tell you what I think has come off the back of all this. I believe that the devil's main objective of Lakeland, of Toronto, of Pensacola and all this other stuff was to put the people of God completely off the Holy Spirit. Do you understand what I'm saying? I'm not talking about the false stuff. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit. And there's so many people today that you, you look at them, you mention the Holy Spirit, you can see in their eye, they're trying to work out, well, what do you mean by that? Well, what I'm talking about today in this is the Holy Spirit, the, the third person of the triunity, the one who's the Bible says there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And we're told at the end of Ephesians, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How on earth are we going to be strong? How on earth are we going to be bold, folks, in the days to come? How are we going to stand without the Holy Spirit? Yeah. Yeah. Now, if you have a look at Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 46, just very quickly, I'm going to whiz through these. Luke 24, verse 46 then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures and he said to them, Thus it was written that the Christ would suffer and rise again on the third day. And that repentance for forgiveness of sins was proclaimed in his name in all the nations beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things and behold I am sending you forth the promise of the Father upon you. But you are to stay in the city until you are clothed with power from on high. That word clothed is the same word in Ephesians 6 that means put on the whole armour of God. Put on, enduo, clothed. And so here they've already been sealed and filled with the Holy Spirit. But he's saying I want you to wait. 40 days Jesus goes up to heaven. You've heard Jacob talk about this many times. And then there was a 10 day period where they were told don't do anything. Just stay there, wait, just wait. And they waited, and let's just turn to Acts chapter 2. On the day of Pentecost, when the day of Pentecost had fully come, the Lord turns up in power. Now, people, when I say this, people, they don't believe me, but Mandy will tell you this is the absolute truth. I can't stand up in front of anybody without the Holy Spirit. I desperately need the Holy Spirit to be with me. It, to, for me, it's the Holy Spirit or bust. It always has been. And when the Lord filled me with the Holy Spirit all those years ago, never in a million years would I have ever thought that I would stand up in front of people and speak. I couldn't think of anything worse. But the, but the Holy Spirit emboldens the church to do what we in the natural cannot do. And forget the showing off of tongues and uh, prophecies that don't come true. Just put all that to one side and understand to be witnesses in these very last days. We need to be clothed with the Holy Spirit. We really do. There is no other way. 
And so he says, when the Holy Spirit had fully come, they were all gathered together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a, a noise, a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole place, the house where they were sitting. I, I have a friend, he's uh, ex-SAS, born again Christian on fire for the Lord, and he, he's always communicating with the church in Iran. And he, was, he told me the other day that the, the ladies in these churches, this is what they're saying. This is what they're saying. They're saying, God is not interested in filling buildings. He's interested in filling people. And I think that's sublime. It sounds so obvious. But is it really? I think for years, the, the model has been fill the building, fill the building. At whatever expense, fill the building. Bring somebody in that can entertain. Oh, they're 4,000 pounds to bring that person. Nevertheless, bring them in if it fills the building. But it's not about filling the building. It's about filling the people because they're the temple of the Holy Spirit and we need the Holy Spirit in his temple. Fill the people. And what happened at the end has to happen again. Turn to verse 37, Acts 2 verse 37. Peter gets up and preaches an absolute incredible sermon. Takes you from the beginning of the church age to the end. And when they heard this, they were pierced in the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said, Repent. Each of you and be baptized in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you, for your children, for all who are far off and as many as the Lord our God will call to himself. I just cannot believe that the Holy Spirit was simply for those days. We had a lady in our church not that long ago, a Jewish lady that was smuggling Bibles into Russia. The, the signs and the wonders and the miracles that's happened in that woman's life, how she escaped again and again and again, terrible imprisonment and beating. Folks, when you get about the Lord's business, he does show up, as we've already heard this morning. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept saying and exhorting them, saying, be saved from this perverse generation. Well, that was perverse generation back then, but my, my goodness me, the West is a powder keg ready to go up. We all know it. Look at the law that's just been passed in Scotland. Yeah. They're just passing a law in Scotland right now um, um, against uh, hate speech. But you can't define it. Who defines what hate speech is? Insane. So those who were baptised received his word and were baptised that on that day 3,000 souls were added. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and so on. I've, now I've, been, I've probably been pastoring about 23 or something years, 24 years. And I have noticed something in the last 10 years. You see, pastors... They pat themselves on the back at the end of the day. They've poured over the word all week and they come together and they preach a couple of challenging sermons. They go home at night and they honestly think that people are still thinking about the sermon that they preach. No, they are. No, they're not. In fact, the truth of the matter is within 10 minutes of that sermon finishing, they've already switched on to something else. There was a time when my pastor, it was a, I love my pastor, he was my internet. There was no internet back then. And he was the one that vetted who I listened to. So my pastor would say to me, you might want to listen to this person, David Pawson. You might want to listen to this person, he'd hand me a tape, David Wilkerson. You might want to listen to this person, Jacob Prash. And I can remember the first Jacob Prash um, message. It was on greater abominations than these, well, you see in the house of the Lord. My pastor was vetted me. He was my internet. So I had this like, continual flow of doctrine that was vetted by my pastor. What pastors don't realise now is, even good ones, what they input into people's lives is probably 5% of what they're listening to on the internet. People's minds doctrinally are mashed. They're completely mashed. They've gone. Now, back in those days, they continually devoted themselves to the apostles' doctrine. They were breaking bread from house to house, and they were still meeting in the temple. Jacob was saying early on about this place, making this place into some kind of a place where they can be training and teaching and, and all kinds of things going on. 
And um, we just heard about the necessity of house groups. Folks, whether we like it or not, I am, I'm convinced it's going to go back that way. It's going to go back to house groups. Yes, there'll be, praise the Lord, bigger meetings where people come together, but there's no continuity in doctrine anymore. And where there's no continuity in doctrine, there is no unity. It's the first thing you have to get right. You must agree on what you agree on. And so I am convinced to some degree that we have to get back to this. In some way, just flick back to Ephesians just for a second. He says, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the full armor of God that you may be able to stand. That word is toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball. When that guy got up, on, got up here, he was that far from my face. His fists were flying around my head. And I felt the Lord say, don't take your eyes off his eyes. We have to stand toe to toe and eyeball to eyeball against this stuff. And it's scary, isn't it? Yes. I think it's scary. It scares me. I'm no uh, uh, brave guy. I'd, I, I'd probably be Gideon, threshing out the, uh, the wheat in a wine press. And the Lord says, yeah, you're a mighty van of... What? Me? A mighty van of valor? Folks, we need the Holy Spirit. It's the Holy Spirit that emboldens the church. For our struggle, that word struggle is wrestle. It's pale, pale, wrestle. And back in those days, they would, they would have these great big wrestling and boxing pavilions. And they were, they were full on. I mean, full on. It was blood. It was a bloodthirsty sport back then. The boxers would wrap leather all the way around them, past their elbows, and they put studs on. They take one another's cheeks off, noses off, ears off. It was, you couldn't lose. When Paul talks about wrestling, we do not wrestle it. The idea is you cannot lose this. The wrestling that happened back then was breaking arms, legs, backs. There were no rules. The only rule was the word wrestle means to slam down your opponent, get your hands around the neck, and very often the victor would gouge the eyes out of the loser. That was what it was. And Paul says, this is what we're up against. But we're not to wrestle against flesh and blood. Now, that's hard. I find that hard. When I see somebody disrupting at the church and causing all kinds of problems, it is so hard to separate that person from what's making them doing what they do. And sometimes you have to put them out. Sometimes you have to even name them because of what they represent, because of who they are. And Paul did that. Nevertheless, our fight is not against flesh and blood. And you know and I know what's coming in. We can see what's coming in. And it's coming in very quickly. And it's easy to get embittered. We have to understand who's behind this. When you look at the principalities and powers here, let's just go through. Our struggle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the rulers. It's notice against, 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 against. Paul wants us to know we are against these things. This is serious. This is a very serious opponent. We are against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. If you piece all this together, I'm just paraphrasing now. What you're looking at here is a highly sophisticated, highly organized realm that's hell-bent on world dominion. That's what this is. And there is a period of time where God will finally, because the, the restrainer will step aside, allow these things to have world dominion for a time. But our fight is against this. Now we can't fight these by binding them, you know, or, or going through the streets and singing nice songs. We mainly fight this through, as we've heard earlier on, Preaching the gospel filled with the Holy Spirit. That's our part in this. That's our battle. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you may be able to resist in the evil day. Church, there's an evil day coming. And it's coming quickly. And I'm beginning to think it's coming quicker than we may think. And we have to get with this. We have to get with this. You know... 
Have you ever felt sorry for yourself? Who's ever felt sorry for themselves? Be honest. Yeah? Well, can I give you... It's already been said earlier on, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say it to you a different way. Pick up your mat and walk. Pick up your mat and walk. Okay, let's get back. Wait, I want, please go to Habakkuk, the book of Habakkuk. Did you know who's seen the film Raiders of the Lost Ark? Anybody seen that film? Did you know if you take out Indiana Jones from that film, just take the main character out, it doesn't change the ending in any way. If you take out the hero from that film, the ending doesn't change in any way, shape or form. And so many Christians are busy engaging and expending all their energy in things that won't make a scrap of difference at the end of this life. We have to get with the picture. And the picture is an invasion is coming. In fact, it, an invasion is happening. This is the evil day. This is our evil day. This is the day that we're going to have to face. Everybody happy? <laughs> the oracle of Habakkuk, Habakkuk means clinger, not cling on, clinger. How long, O oh Lord, will I call for help? How long? How long? And you will not hear. I cry out to you, violence. It just so happens that that word violence in the Hebrew is Hamas. Interesting. Yet you do not save. Why do you not make, why do you make me see iniquity and cause me to look on wickedness? Yes, destruction and violence are before me. Strife exists and contention arises. Therefore the law is ignored and justice is never upheld. For the wicked surround the righteous. Therefore justice comes out of perversion. I like what Habakkuk is doing here. There's no point in praying to the Lord in the morning and saying, Hi Lord, you're amazing. I just want to tell you, you're amazing. And I want you to know that life is excellent. So that's it for today. I'll see you tomorrow. We're, we are supposed to engage with our God. He cares for us. Cast your burdens unto Jesus. He has broad shoulders. He is not a God that's so far away like Allah that has nothing to do with us, that just wants us to, to submit. He wants his people to engage with him like Moses engaged with him. Like Abraham, the friend of God, said to him, shall not the God of the whole earth do what is right? We are to walk with God and engage with him. And that's what Habakkuk is doing. He's not doing anything wrong. He's saying, Lord, what on earth is happening in the church? And when I look at the church, and I don't want to depress you. <laughs> I, don't want to, I don't want to put anybody on the downer, right? If I could give you a piece of my mind about what I think about the church, you'd leave me slashing your wrists. But the church is in, in, in a shocking way in the West. A shocking way. And as every week goes by, I think, what is happening to people? Where's the desire? And he cries out to God and he says, you've got to do something about this, Lord. Because... So the Lord does something. And when the Lord does something, Habakkuk's then saying, no, 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 that's far too much. You're going way too far there. What do you think you're doing that for? And so many of us... We think that an answer to prayer is when God answers prayer the way we want him to answer. Yes. But that does, that's not necessarily an answer to prayer. An answer to prayer can be, I have a solution for you and this is it. I'm going to raise up the, the Babylonians. And you think, that can't be. That just can't be. I'm going to raise up Islam to judge the West. That can't be. How can that possibly, how, how can you do that, Lord? Look among the nations. Observe. Be astonished. Wonder. Because I'm about to do something in your days. Remember, it says in Ephesians 6, to stand in the day of evil. 
I'm about to do something in your days that you would not believe it if you were told. For I am raising up the Chaldeans. I'm raising them up. And folks, you've got to look at the situation. And, you know, somebody sent me through uh, um, um, from, from the trains from the underground in, in London recently, all the uh, scriptures coming up from the Quran um, in the notices, you know, in the timetables, scriptures on the Quran. You, you cannot believe this. This is happening. Things are changing exponentially. You know, the vector that Jacob talks about, it's getting faster and faster and faster. You can't keep up. I find myself now having to be careful how much news I watch because I have to watch this. I have to make sure that this is right. Look among the nations. Be astonished. This is what I'm about to do. I'm going to raise up. 2003, I think it was, David Pawson. And he, he wrote a book on Islam. Anybody ever read that book? Who read that book? Unbelievable book. I couldn't believe it. I read it from cover to cover. He says, within 25 years, this nation will be an, an Islamic nation. Yes. Are you so calm about it? Typical David, so calm about it. It's like, it's going to happen. Well, what are we so, supposed to do, David? Uh, will you find out when you get there? The fierce and impetuous people who march throughout the earth to seize dwelling places which are not theirs. They are dreaded and feared. Their justice and authority originate with themselves. Their horses are swifter than leopards and keener than wolves in the evening. Their horsemen come galloping. Their horsemen come from afar. They fly like an eagle, swooping down to devour all them come to violence. Their horde of faces move forward. They collect captives like sand. They mock at kings and rulers are, laugh, are, are a laughing matter to them. Yay? Yeah. Rulers are a laughing matter to them. Yeah. They laugh at every fortress and heap up rubble to capture it. Then they will sweep through like the wind and pass on, but they will be held guilty. They whose strength is their God. And so now Habakkuk comes back again. He says, are you not from everlasting? O oh Lord, my God, my Holy One, we will not die. You, O oh Lord, have appointed them to judge. You're going to judge them. How many times have you read Revelation chapter 1 where it says, I was on the Isle of Patmos for the word of God. Have you ever really thought about that? You see, church, if we're going to go to prison, you must go to prison for the word of God. Not for your own opinion or for some matter that riles you. You've got to make sure if you're going to go there that it's for the word of God so that if you go there, you become a blessing. They are judging us. O oh, you, O oh, rock, have you have established them to correct. Your eyes are too pure to approve evil. And you cannot look on wickedness with favour. These are Habakkuk's words. Why do you look with favour on those who deal treacherously? Why are you silent when the wicked swallow up those more righteous than they? Quick look at uh, uh, Genesis chapter 32 just for a minute. Genesis 32, 24, very quickly, I'm going to mess about here. Before we can wrestle, and we will wrestle, we will stand toe to toe, eyeball to eyeball with principalities. Before we wrestle with them, we have to wrestle with God. How are we going to wrestle with them without wrestling with God? When Jacob was left alone, he was left alone. Have you ever been left alone? Has that ever, ever happened in your life yet? Where you come to a point where God strips you of everything around you. And if God doesn't step in, you're finished. There's no plan B and there's no safety net. If God doesn't step in, it's over for you. That was Jacob. He was left alone. And he wrestled through the night, the time of Jacob's trouble. He wrestled with the Lord and thanked the Lord. The Lord eventually blessed him. He said, I will not let you go until you bless me. Where is that today, church? I said to our church two weeks ago, 
This, we have every week, we have three people that go in the back, right? Every week before I get there, there's three people in the back praying. When the church finally turns up, whatever amount there is, I wonder how amazing it would be if, there were, if actually there was 40 people in the back instead of three people in the back. Do you understand? We come. We've got into this consumer Christianity today, this driving McDonald's Christianity, where we come for a bit of fast food and off we go. But we have to wrestle with God. Have a look at Hosea. Hosea. Hosea chapter 5 verse 15. I will go away and return to my place until they acknowledge their guilt and seek my face. In their affliction they will earnestly seek me. The other day I was praying for, um, for the hostages. And I've, got, I've said to our church, I've got to be honest, I'm ashamed to say this, I had gotten out of the habit of praying for those poor people. You know, I'd forgotten. And I started to pray for them and I felt the Holy Spirit so strong. Just so strong. And as I began to pray for them, I believe the Lord said to me, my people, that is Israel, they have to repent. They have to repent. And we're busy praying for the hostages to be released. And there's nothing wrong with that, friends. But we need to pray that the people of God start to turn to the one they rejected. You shall not see me again until I hear you say, Blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. He will revive us after two days, and on the third day, he will raise us up. This is what I believe we see in the book of Habakkuk. Just go back to Habakkuk for a second. We have to wrestle with God, friends. Now let's go to chapter 2. Chapter 2, you, you'll never, we're never going to be able to wrestle with the enemy until we wrestle with our God in prayer and in fasting. Habakkuk 2, I will stand on my guard on, on the watchtower and station myself on the rampart. I will keep my watch to see what he will speak to me and how I may reply when I am reproved. And then the Lord answered and said to me, Record the vision and inscribe it on tablets, on tablets of stone, that the one who reads it might run with it. The one that reads it might run with it. If this was written today, God would be saying, put this on social media. Stick it on social media. What are you supposed to put on that? Stick it on Facebook. Stick it on YouTube. Stick it on Twitter. Stick it everywhere you can. Well, what are we to stick? God is raising up the enemy, but the just shall live by faith. I believe that's a message. God is raising up the enemy, but the just shall live by faith. And so he says, write it on tablets of stone. Somehow, and I don't know what the answer is, but somehow the message that you know. I remember when Jacob did the Daniel Project. My son watched that three times. My son said that was the best thing he'd ever seen because it was, it was, it was aimed at his level and he could see what was coming in and there's a gospel message in there. Write it down on tablets of stone, make it plain and run with it. And that's what we have to do today. You have to understand, folks, we've been commissioned. And the commission is to get the gospel of the kingdom out. We've got to make it plain. We've got to make it discernible. We've got to make it understandable. We've got to make it that children can understand this message. And run with it. So that they will run with it. Because time is running out. And he says, though he tarries, he says... He, um, for this vision is yet for an appointed time. It hastens towards the goal and it will not fail. It's going to happen. There's an invasion coming. I saw it myself. Invasion, occupation, destruction. Three phases. Invasion that leads to occupation. They want to destroy us, but they will not be able to. We'll get to that at the end. The enemy wants to destroy us, but thank the Lord we're hidden in the palm of the hands of the Almighty. The vision is yet for the appointed time. It hastens toward the goal. It, 
and it will not fail, though it tarries, wait for it, for it will certainly come, and it will not delay. Behold, as for the proud, his soul is not right within him. The church model that you and I have grown up in is broken. This empire building church model that our denomination is right and everybody else's denomination is wrong and this name badge mentality, this pride and arrogance that we have it right and everybody else has got it wrong, that you know we're going to plant our denomination thing here, there and everywhere. This arrogance that thinks that, you know, somehow we have it, it leads to nothing. There's such pride in the body of Christ, such pride. Behold, as for the proud, we have to crucify self. And I can't believe it, when, when COVID happened, and you might think that I'm being terrible now, you might want to slap me on the wrist for saying this. But when COVID happened, I was glad because I knew that the church model that we've been in for decades just doesn't work anymore. People hardly get saved. People hardly get discipled. There's no desire anymore. We're on a treadmill, folks. We're going round and round on the same treadmill, week in, week out, month in, month out, year in and year out. And when COVID happened and the world went into chaos, I thought, thank God, thank God, something needs to happen. And I can remember, because we were in a camper van on a farm at the time, and when the church is shut, there were people that came up to that farm from London, lots of young people, lots of young people. And during COVID, when we were in lockdown, they were knocking on our camper van door, I kid you not, asking us to share our faith with them around a fire. Now, when does that happen? That just doesn't happen. And during lockdown, we, we, we were gathered around these young people from London, sharing our faith with them. And I thought, God, there's another way. There's another way that's far more organic. There's no ego in it. There's no big players in this. And that's why I'm convinced, friends, that at some point the church has to go back to house groups. Our church is split into three house groups, basically. It's split into three house groups. So if it ever goes wrong, they kind of know what to do. If one of those house groups goes rogue, and they will, and they will, it doesn't affect the others. You know, folks, why did Judas, why, how did they know where to find Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Because Judas was part of the inner circle. Yeah. I'm telling you, the person that most likely will betray you is the proud, arrogant person that thinks they know everything about everything. They're the ones that are most likely to betray you in the last days. And that was Judas. And they know where you live. And they, they tell the authorities. Behold, as for the proud one, his soul is not right within him. But the just shall live by faith. Do you see the difference, church? Do you see the difference between the proud and the arrogant and this, this treadmill Christianity which we've seen for so long that's going nowhere? We're making no ground. But there's coming a point where God will raise a remnant who, who, the word faith can be translated faithfulness. The just shall live by faith. They will live by faith. Let me turn, just turn with me please to Romans just for a minute. Romans chapter 1, Romans chapter 1 verse 16. This is the Apostle Paul. I am not ashamed of the gospel. It is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes to the Jew first and also to the Greek, for in it the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. We'd all agree with that, wouldn't we? We'd all agree with that. Now let me ask you something. It, there is, it's one thing to have faith for salvation. It's another thing to have faith 
for our everyday life. One thing to have faith for salvation, another thing to actually have faith when all kinds of trouble starts in, in the mix, in the mix of it all. I believe there's a lot of people that have used John 3.16 as an insurance policy, basically. It's just an insurance policy to them. But what about the faithfulness? The just shall live by faithfulness. Our faith is going to be tested. When the Son of Man comes, will he find faith? Have a look at Luke chapter 7. Luke chapter 7 verse 9. And when Jesus heard this at him, he turned and said to the crowd that was following him, I say to you, not even in Israel have I seen faith like this. It's talking about the centurion. Do you know what amazes me? It amazes me that God in flesh is amazed at people's faith. How can God in flesh be amazed at people's level of faith? He was amazed that the centurion had a lot of faith. He was amazed that his disciples had little faith. He even rebuked his disciples. But the just shall live by faith. And I'm not talking about Kenneth Copeland giving you a hanky to, to, to anoint and believe, folks. I'm talking about real faith, that which we need to live by. People said to me when I had a big tumour, they said to me, unless you have real faith, you will die. That's what they told me. Some people from America, that's what they said to me. I went to the Lord, I said, Lord, I don't believe I have a lot of faith. I probably have faith the size of a mustard seed. I don't know how much I have, but the faith I have, I put in you. The just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Mark chapter 8, Mark chapter 8, verse 25. And they came to him, and they woke him and said, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. It's one thing to have faith for salvation, another thing to have faith when things are happening in your life. And he said to them, why are you afraid, you men of little faith? And of course, he rebuked the sea. Have a look at Matthew chapter 14, 28. Matthew 14, 28. And Peter said to him, Lord, if it is you, command me to come to you and walk on the water. And he said, come. And Peter got out of the boat and walked on the water and came to Jesus. But seeing the wind... He became very frightened and beginning to sink, he cried out, Lord, save me. Lord, save me. You ever cry, have you, anybody ever prayed that prayer? Yeah. I'm talking about after salvation. Yeah. Lord, save me. I am in such a mess here. I'm going under, Lord. Save me. And what happens, church? What happens? He always, that right arm always comes out and pulls us out. Yeah. What an awesome God we serve. I don't know about you, I don't see myself as, as somebody with a great measure of faith, but just a little bit that you have, God will get you through. Have a look at 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy 4, 1. Our faith is going to be tested. In fact, Timothy says some people's faith is going to be shipwrecked. Anybody ever been in a shipwreck? Yeah? yeah? Anybody ever heard when the boat cracks on the rocks beneath them and it tears the hull to pieces? Apparently, it's one of the most terrifying noises you can hear. Happened to Paul on several occasions. People's faith in the last days, is some people's faith, is going to be shipwrecked. There are people that, that want to tell you that you cannot lose your salvation. That it can't, you can never lose your salvation. And therefore, it's okay to take the mark of the beast. Take the mark, because actually, you can't lose your salvation anyway. So, as long as you're the elect, you, you know, just take the mark. It's a major problem, folks. I kid you. It is a major, major problem. And John Wesley talked about it years ago. He said it was a blasphemous doctrine that made God out to be a liar, that made God out to be worse than the devil himself. And the, the trouble is we're moving into the days where we have to have faith in the Lord. The just shall live by faith. And we've got people saying, oh, don't worry about it. Kick up your feet. Don't worry about evangelism. After all, you can't fall away. Well, that's not what the Bible says. 1 Timothy 4.1. But the Spirit expressively says that in the latter days, some will fall away from the faith. They will fall away from the faith. 2 Timothy 2.1. But false prophets 
also arose among the people, just as there was also, there was also false teachers among you, who will secretly introduce destructive heresies, even denying the master. Notice that. Listen, even denying the master. I'll tell you, when you take the mark, you deny the master. That's what happens. When a person takes the mark, they deny the master. Even denying the master who bought them. That word bought them is exactly the same Greek word used in Corinthians. You have been bought with a price. The word is you've been redeemed. These people had been bought. Who had been bought? These people that had turned out to be false teachers had been bought. It's the same word that's used in Revelation chapter 5. Those that have been bought by the blood of the Lamb from every tribe, every tongue and every nation. They have been bought. But look what they do. They bring in heresies. And the Bible says, bringing swift destruction to themselves. Many will follow them in sensuality and, be, and because of them, the way of the truth will be maligned. Then he compares them to the angels that left their abode. Go to verse 20. For, for if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome the last state has become worse than the first state. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed to them. It has happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit and a sow after washing returns into the wallowing of its mire. Isn't that incredible? The warning is very clear. If you've tasted of the goodness of God, if you've tasted of the grace of God, if you are in Christ, there's a warning in the last days. Watch out for the boastful. Watch out for the prideful. Because the just shall live by faith. Not just faith for salvation, a one-off thing, but faith to faith as it is written. Faith to faith as it is written. The just shall live by faith. I once took a homeless guy... Um, to see an ex-football um, player that was, uh, that was under Brian, he, he served under Brian Clough. He knew Roy Keane and all them. I thought, oh, I'll take him along. He got to save this guy. So I'll take this homeless guy along because he liked football. And they put us at the top table because they knew this guy was homeless. He got nothing. They wanted him to see this professional football player had come to know the Lord. So we were on the top table. There's about 200 people in this room and we were eating. We were eating and we had this lovely food and he's listening to this guy's testimony about how he came to know the Lord and he, I've never seen a person scoff food so quick in all my life because their money goes on white lightning and monkey dust. Does anybody know what white lightning is? It's the cheapest, strongest cider possible and monkey dust in Stoke-on-Trent is an incredibly cheap kind of cocaine fix that's incredibly dangerous so all their money goes on that they have no money for food so he got this food so he scoffs all this food up right you've never seen anybody eat food so quick in your life then in front of 200 people this guy puked the whole lot back onto his plate the whole lot straight onto his plate and I'm I'm there and everybody can see, this is my guest. <laughs> this is my guest. But it didn't stop there. Because this guy um, basically spends all his money on white lightning and monkey dust and never has anything to eat, he went on to eat every last part. He scooped every last part that was on that plate back into his mouth. And I'll tell you, there are people spiritually like that. Spiritually like that. We are... People are apostatizing, they're leaving the faith, they are compromising, they know what's coming, they're frightened, they don't know what to do, they've got their heads in the sand. L listen, I told you about a guy at the beginning, he, he was definitely possessed. I'm telling you this, demon possession will become a common thing in the church in the days to come. Because if all you're going to say is come as you are, Come as you are, no repentance needed, doesn't matter what background you come from, you're going to end up with demon-possessed people in the church. But it won't be the real church. They're going to have a lot to deal with. Let's go to 2 Thessalonians and we'll come back. 2 Thessalonians 2. 
Funny thing about demon-possessed people is they only manifest when, well, when people like Jesus turn up. They'd rather not be known. They'd rather do this stuff in the background. In 2 Thessalonians 2, Paul talks about when the rapture is going to happen, right? And he, and he basically tells them not to be shaken. Don't be shaken. And there's such a shaking coming, isn't there? A terrible shaking coming. And there's a spirit coming. Apostasy is coming. He says these two things are going to have to happen before the rapture of the church. There's going to be a falling away. I preached this at a church down south not that long ago. And two people came up to me and said, what do you mean by falling away? What do you mean by falling away? They didn't even believe there was going to be a falling away. So there's going to come a falling away and the, and the man of perdition is going to be revealed. You, you all get that. I know you all get that, right? Then Paul goes on to explain that there is someone that's restraining evil right now. He's restraining evil. The Bible tells us in, in the Gospel of John that the Holy Spirit comes to convict the world of sin, of righteousness, of judgment. When the Apostle Paul came to the, the, the uh, people at Thessalonica, he said, I didn't just come to you in word. I came to you in power and in the conviction of the Holy Spirit. They knew what he meant by the restrainer. They knew what the Holy Spirit was like because when the gospel came to them, it didn't just come in word, it came in power with the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the Apostle Paul begins to explain to them that this restrainer is going to step out of the road. There's going to come a time, we see it in Genesis chapter 6, my spirit will not strive with men forever. The, the, the restrainer will move to one side and literally all hell will break loose on this planet. Habakkuk is, prophetically speaking, is about the events leading up to that time. But the just shall live by faith. The just shall live by faith. Let's go back and let's just finish off this morning. Habakkuk 3. Something happens in the last chapter. Habakkuk has a change of mind. Suddenly he starts to see things differently. And I believe this is going to happen to the church. A prayer of Habakkuk, the prophet, according to Shiganoth. This is almost a song. This is what he says. Lord, I have heard the report about you and I fear. O oh Lord, revive your work in the midst of the years. In the midst of the years, make it known. There is not going to be a worldwide revival in the days to come. But there is something. There's something. And it's this. No one can stop you from having your own personal revival with Jesus. The only person that can stop you from having your personal revival with Jesus is you. And... I remember during COVID, I remember running through the, the fields where I was and crying out to the Lord, Lord, I never thought it would be possible, but you have got me back to my first love. And it is possible to get back to your first love. It is possible to have your own personal revival. God is good. God is faithful. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That is the God that we serve. And then he goes on and he says this. In wrath, remember mercy. In wrath, remember mercy. And we've just heard for the last hour and a half this morning how important the gospel is. I've heard people say to me recently that, you know, love is not really that important to God it's kind of a, a little part but it's not a big part and he's really God is all about justice and holiness and wrath of course he's about all those things right of course he is but the main reason that Jesus that God sent his only son to this earth 
to the cross for God so agape loved this world he did it because he loves fallen mankind and the gospel is for the whosoever he sends his son to this world because there's no other way the Bible says we're all sinners and Christ comes for sinners therefore Christ has come for all and he came to this sin sick world and he hung his own son upon the cross and upon the cross he bore our sin and God poured out his wrath upon his own son and in his wrath in his justice in his holiness in his righteousness he remembers the mercy of God towards you and me because right in the middle of the tabernacle, in the very, very middle of the tabernacle, there is a place called the mercy seat because we serve a merciful God whose mercies are new every morning, whose faithfulness towards you and I is great, who wants to get every single one of us back to our first love, who wants to fill us once again with the Holy Spirit of promise, who wants to clothe us with power from on high to face the devil in these last days and friends I believe it I believe in these last days God will give us everything that we need to stand and in his wrath he is remembering mercy he loves you you are not a robot you were not predetermined before time begun to go either to heaven or to hell he created all people to be given a chance to either accept him or reject him. And in his wrath upon his own son, he remembers mercy for his creation. What an awesome God. This is what separates him from every other God on this planet. There's nobody like him. He can be, we can be a friend of God. Walk with God like Enoch and Noah. Amen. In his wrath, in your wrath, Lord, remember mercy, and he does. And God comes from Tim, and he comes, the Holy One from Mount Paran, and his splendor covers the heavens, and the earth is full of his praise. His radiance is like sunlight, his rays flashing from his hand, and there, and there is the hiding of his power. Before him goes pestilence, and plague comes after him. He stood and surveyed the earth, he looked and startled the nations. Yes, the perpetual mountains were shattered. The ancient hills collapsed. His ways are everlasting. I saw the tents of Kushan under distress and the, t uh, the tent curtains of the land of Midian were trembling. Did the Lord rage against the rivers? Or was your anger against the rivers? Or was your wrath against the sea that you rode on your horses and on your chariots of salvation? Your bow was made bare. The rods of chastisement were sworn. You cleaved the earth with rivers. That's beautiful. The mountains saw you and quaked. The downpour of water swept by. The deep uttered forth its voice. It lifted high its hands, sun and moon stood in their places. They went away at the light of your arrows, at the radiance of your gleaming spear. In indignation you marched through the earth, in anger you trampled the nations. You went forth for the salvation of your people, for the salvation of your anointed. If God is for us, who can be against us? In your wrath, remember mercy. Write it down on tablets of stone and run with it. That We are undergoing an invasion, but the just shall live by faith. You struck the head of the house of evil. This is the day of evil. He will strike the head of the house of evil. The enemy is coming to invade. He's coming to occupy and he wants to destroy, but he will not be able to destroy because we serve an awesome God. And God has a plan. And listen, this is part of his plan. It says in Habakkuk, the, 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 the proud, that the arrogant one, my soul is not with him. Listen, we have to die to self. We have to be buried to self and then the Lord can resurrect us. He can do something with our lives if we will just die to self, if we will put our own agenda to one side and realise we are in this together, friends, all of us. It's not going to be easy, but God is for us. 
You pierced with your own spears the head of your throngs. They stormed in to scatter us. Their exultation was like those who devour the oppressed in secret. You trample on the sea with your horses and on the surge of many waters. And then he says this. I have heard and my inward parts tremble. They tremble at the, uh, at the sound. My lips quivered. Decay enters my bones, and in my place I tremble. Listen, because I must wait quietly for the day of distress. Stand firm in the day of evil. I must wait quietly for the day of distress for the people to arise who will invade us. Who will invade us? Now, Hear me out, please. This is the lowest point in Habakkuk. That verse there is the lowest point. We know we're in a waiting game. We know at the moment that there is no power in the church. And right now, Islam is taking the West. This place is a powder keg. It's a waiting game. We're just waiting. This is the lowest point. The church seemingly has no power. It seems as though it's all over. We've, we're not only dead, we're buried. And that's when resurrection comes. Yes. Something happens here that's just... <sighs> I went to see a, um, a friend in, in our church. She's been there since, since the days of Adam. Very faithful lady. And she's lost maybe four stone in weight. She looks so ill. And I went to see her and her eyes are gleaming with Christ. And I'm looking and thinking, I wonder how long she's got left. I don't know whether the Lord's going to take her or what's going to happen. And uh, I said to her, how are you feeling? And she says to me, I just can't feel the presence of God. That's my biggest concern. And I said to her, I can see the glory of Christ in your eyes. She was beaming. Beaming. At Mandy and Kevin were with me. She was beaming with God. But she couldn't feel God. She was beaming with Christ. But she, she'd got no actual feeling that anything good was happening. It's going to be like that. Remember 10 days leading up to Pentecost where there's no power? The 10 days of awe at the end, Jacob's talked about this many a time. You can't rely on your feelings because there's going to come a time when it will feel like there's nothing there. There's no power there, but there is. Because our God is good and when we're dead and when we're buried, there's only one more stage left and it's God's mysterious resurrection. The Lord moves in mysterious ways. He's wonders to perform. How on earth? What are you going to do about this invasion that's coming? I'm going to, I'm going to raise the Babylonians. Well, I don't like that, Lord. Well, it's going to happen and you're going to have to die and be buried, but resurrection is coming. Look at this. It's unreal. This is what he says. Though the fig tree should not blossom. This is, there's no hope here. The fig tree, Israel, no hope. There is no fruit in the vines. There's no fruit of the spirit. There's nothing. There's nothing to say that anything's happening. Though the yield of the olive should fail. There's no sign of the Holy Spirit. There's no sign of him. Do you understand? Folks, there is such a lack of desire today for the Holy Spirit. The olive is failing. But it says here, though the fig tree will not blossom, though there's no fruit on the vines, though the olive tree fails, though there seems to be nothing happening, there's no produce in the fields, there's no flock, they've been cut off, they've been scattered in the wilderness. There is no cattle in the stalls. And then he says this. Where does this come from? Where does this come from? Where does this come from? I tell you, it doesn't come from us. This that you see here is not part of our equation. 
This comes from somewhere else. This is God's work. And it's wonderful in our eyes. When everything has failed, when we haven't just died but we're buried, then comes resurrection. I will exult in the Lord. I will rejoice. What are you rejoicing about? There's nothing to rejoice about. I know. I get it. There's nothing to rejoice about. And yet I am. Yeah. Have you ever been there? Yeah. I have. I've been there. There's nothing to rejoice about. So why am I crazily feeling like I need to rejoice? Well, the doctor's just told you you've got three months to live. And why am I rejoicing? This is the... Only Jesus can do this. And he will. Because he says, I will never leave you nor forsake you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. I will rejoice in the God of my salvation. The joy of the Lord is my strength. The Lord God is my strength. Ephesians 6.10 Stand. How on earth are you going to stand? In the joy of the Lord. In the joy of the of the Lord and this is the, the crazy part right and you, you do need to check this out on YouTube he has made my feet like Heinz feet <laughs> and he's made me to walk in the mountain places have you ever seen these creatures yeah. they are ridiculous go and look at them on YouTube watch them look at their hooves they have these Cleaved hooves that have soft pads underneath and they have like two pincers and these pincers are like ice axes that rock climbers use going up ice falls. They are bizarre creatures. Go on YouTube and watch them scale up almost vertical mountains like this. They're bizarre. They, they get in on the mountain at a sheer drop like that and they pick their way up and they can leap and run. I've seen bears coming after them. I've seen snow leopards coming after them and they're just flying up these mountains. What Habakkuk is saying is, I never had this ability before. I never had the ability to get away before, but you've given me an ability that wasn't there. You've given me feet to get over my mountains. And he actually says in the Bible, Genesis 19, flee to the mountains. Matthew 24, flee to the mountains. Hebrews 11, the faith chapter, those that wander in deserts and mountains. And he's going to give us the feet to walk in these places. Let me explain it to you from a spiritual context. Kari Tan Boon, in that death camp, had hind feet. Do you understand? To do what you simply cannot do. So when there's no hope, there's, there's no real hiding place, Christ becomes your hiding place. You know it and I know it. We, we know it. Deep down, we know it. We know we haven't got it in us. We know that at some point in ourselves we probably crack, but our God is faithful. Amen. Be strong in the Lord. Hear that? That's the secret. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Amen.